So we go. So some people already know that two years ago, I had the wonderful opportunity to publish this book, Global Health Impacts of Nanotechnology Law, a tool for stakeholder engagement. And I've been very, very fortunate that the law has been growing so that there's always a great deal to say that's new. And this time, I want to specifically address how the law is fighting COVID-19 because um, nanotechnology and law are sometimes viewed as very distinct things, but actually they're in very, very interrelated and together. And COVID-19 has posed challenges for both the technical side and the legal side. And uh, the purpose here today is to try and really look at the bigger picture we have wonderful, wonderful presentations about the little tiny nanoparticle worlds. And I want us to break the silos and to think very carefully about what this all means when we put it together. And I'll even tell you the reasons why I want to do that towards the end. Uh, as some of you know, I am a lawyer by training. I am a member of the bar of the Supreme Court of the United States. And I have a master's in science in public health from Johns Hopkins University, and also um, a doctorate in international relations. And yes, I work at the European Scientific Institute. This year, I'm also an invited professor at the University of Grenoble. And in my spare time, I run a small NGO called the Work Health and Survival Project. So first of all, what's the working assumption here? Lots of scientific literature has talked about nanotechnology as a revolution for science she, she and because of the new ways we look at matter and also as a revolution for commerce because of the cool little products that we're coming up with. And I have always said my bias in this story is that it will also revolutionize public health. And unfortunately, COVID-19 is proving this to be true. So just to remind people of how big a picture I wanna look at, we're looking at when it comes to nanotechnology, we're looking at the coming together of public health, of a series of emerging technologies, many of which are nano enabled, such as AI and big data and international laws. And today we're gonna go right in the middle of that confluence, that convergence of all three of these fields. We have a very heavy agenda. I'm going to review a little bit what is nanotechnology because you may be surprised, but under law, it's not necessarily what the scientists think it is. And legal definitions are extraordinarily important under law, but also when you wanna manage programs, when you wanna seek funding, or when you wanna solve a problem. So I will very briefly jump around and mention a bunch of new, what's called nano regulations. When I started this field, that word did not exist. I didn't start that long ago, but now we have nano regulations and I'm gonna talk briefly about them to show you that this is really serious that this exists. And then all of a sudden, right in the middle of all these beautiful laws that we've been constructing, along comes COVID-19, which is a game changer because executive orders with the stroke of the legislative pen have suspended a great deal of legal activity, especially labor laws and also a lot of other laws, but ironically have actually been very good for developing political will about health laws if we decide to try and channel that, that energy sometime in the future into real legislation to prepare for other pandemics. But one of the really important things is that COVID-19 has forced a pause for reflection for the entire world, everybody. And the list of possible uses of nanotechnology in the fight for COVID-19 conquest is just as important as the questions that they raise that are going to actually influence the future of public health and the future impact of nanotechnology's revolution under law. So there's a whole bunch of questions that we will take a few minutes to look at. And then at the end, I wanna sort of wrap up with some lessons learned from this pause and the inextricable link between work and health 
and survival of civil society, not just the health of individuals, but the entire system. The, the concept I would like to advance towards the end is that actually health is a public good that hasn't been thought about that way all the time in science and only sometimes under law. So first of all, when we're defining nanotechnology under law, one of the themes here is to have um, from ideas to a vision. And so I didn't know that, but I have put in an imaginary place because when you're defining nanotechnology under law, there's that little idea in your head of what you think the law should be, whether or not there is an existing law. And that's an imaginary place. That is a place that may not necessarily exist yet. And then you have to think about, of course, the role of stakeholders in standard setting for nano safety and harmonization and how we're going to bring a whole bunch of laws together at the same time. So from a standpoint of policy, this is an old question that has not gone away throughout all the study of nanotechnology. And in fact, COVID-19 sort of shines a bright spotlight on these questions. Because if you look at nanotechnology and you look at the concept of risk globally, then you actually realize that you have um, a great deal of new risk and therefore the old questions remain extremely important. So the challenge has always been for people that are in the scientific world, does the nature of engineered nanostructured materials and devices present new safety and health risks? But when you look at the law, you know, even not everybody's a lawyer and not everybody's a scientist, but we did learn a few weeks ago that most people will vote if given the opportunity. And those voters may not be lawyers or scientists, but they have opinions and interests in what's going on with nanotechnology. And this question that I've just given you is just a little too technical for people who worry about whether their taxes are going up go up when they think about legislation or they, they think about whether the price of the bridge toll is gonna go up. And so the real question from the point of view of society that legislatures care about is how can the benefits of nanotechnology be realized while proactively minimizing the potential risk? And COVID-19 has made this question front and center because we have so many new forms of awareness of risk because of our fear of exposure to COVID-19 and our difficulty in controlling it, that this question is really just as important, if not more so, as it ever was. So first of all, when you're defining something under law, of course, the definition, if you're a legislature, doesn't have to have anything to do with what the thing really is. I want to be very clear about that. In fact, as paradoxical and surprising as that sounds, a lot of legislatures avoid the whole question, just dodge it by never defining what they are about. So the Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970 of the United States does not define occupational, does not define safety, and does not define health. The Disability Convention that the United Nations has set forth does not define disability, even though it's about protecting people from discrimination based on disability. Well, how's that happen, Elise? I mean, like, wow, that's weird. It's because there are two methods that we can employ here. One is a very traditional, narrow set of approaches. You just write a list. Looks great. We know where we stand. If you're on the list, you're regulated. If you're off the list. But you know what? Things come along that nobody thought about. Unfortunately, COVID-19 is a perfect example. Nobody writing a list in 2017 or 18, or maybe even 19, as a group of experts, would have put the words COVID-19 on the list. And along comes this devastating social change that's viral, but could be any number of other social catastrophes. And it could be an earthquake, could be a tsunami. And 
what do you do if it's not on the list, but you need the power, the authority to deal with this problem? So a list falls short because you can leave out too much, you can leave out something important, or you can accidentally include something that doesn't belong on the list at all. So there's another technique. This is the technique that doesn't necessarily define the subject of the law, and that's criteria. And as my daughter would say, that sounds complicated because it's flexible and you can add things. You can't escape it easily if you fit the criteria, but you can get out of the law if in fact it sounds like you fit in the law, but when you look carefully at the criteria, you don't. And that avoids Mickey Mouse laws. There's Mickey Mouse right in front of the volumes of the US Constitution. But the fact is that this is a, a harder to sell politically, but ultimately much more useful. And COVID-19 shows us exactly why. So what is that about for nano? How big is nano? Well, I'm sure that the previous speaker can give you a very beautiful scientific definition, but I want to remind you that that's a consensus definition among scientists. If you like the idea that it's 100 nanometers or less on one or more dimensions, that's great. But right there in the Swiss grocery stores almost 10 years ago, we had the idea of nanomania, a little toy about the size of a red kidney bean. And that's really millions and millions and millions of nanoparticles, but it's just a tiny little toy. And the question is always, does, when the chain gives that out and people are trading it, what does the public think? Does the public think that this is what nanotechnology is? And more importantly, does the public think that that little nano toy is regulated and protected as nano regulations come into play? So, Nanotechnology is huge, it's not little. It was 3 trillion US dollars in 2015. It's expected to be $14 trillion before 2022. And is a refresher for people that are always in the lab. It's ubiquitous in society. This is a slide from 2008. And you see already in 2008, all types of drugs, cars, paints, protective equipment, it's been everywhere. And because of that, places like the Swiss National Foundation and, and the Science Foundation and other government agencies spent a great deal of time worrying about whether these materials have potential consequences that could cause harm in novel ways. And the very unusual thing we saw before the birth of the nano regulations that are so vibrant now is that governments were willing to say out loud and admit that they don't know what's going on. And at the same time, the things that are happening are really, really cool. This is of course from the National Nanotechnology Initiative in the States. And they're talking about synthetic skin with nanosensors so that somebody who has lost an arm or a leg or some fingers could have new limbs that will have the sense of touch. It's an amazing idea. And of course, we have the European uh, Food Safety Authority, which worries about nano safety, nanostructures in food. Nanostructures is definitely a word we would not have seen in the law 10 years ago, but now is not only in the EFSA law, but it's also in the US Department of Agriculture discussion of nanopesticides. People are worried about what these nanostructures can do. And so they regulate things like the lining of the truck that also has, of course, nano carbon nanotubes on the tires and nanotubes protecting the glass. The packaging, which is made from carbon nanotubes, that definitely helps the food last longer. And it's lighter packaging, so it's cheaper to ship. And of course, because we believe it will last longer, that means insurance and it means storage and a whole bunch of other overhead costs are going to go down in price because we don't have to spend as much. We can keep the food longer without loss and wastage. 
we can have it in lighter packaging and it's less likely that either a bug or a thief is going to break it open and steal it. So these are very important outcomes. The nanotechnology in how we, we serve the food, the, the plates and the dishes, and even the fork from the field to fork itself. And just in case you think that this piece of nanotechnology is just on earth, food for thought, we have people who have stem cells in outer space labs using nano enabled productivity that are growing meat in space from animal cells. So the question is, of course, is it meat? Is it food? What law governs it? Is EFSA going to cover this? And the reality is that there is already a great deal of existing law in outer space, not just the agreements that make the labs happen, but also the agreements that made possible the exploration of space. And they're gonna to be touched by nanotechnology too. So it's no longer true that it's just the cosmetics and food on earth, it's the entire cosmos. Well, so you might not be surprised that people like the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health in the United States as long ago as 2011, were worried about the justification for recommendations preventing risks from carbon nanotubes and nanofibers. They looked at the literature and started a process of creating an amazing database that is available to everyone in the world free of charge, not just on carbon nanotubes and titanium dioxide and nano silver, but on a whole bunch of best practices and how to do things. They started in 2011 and they were first worried about the ability to actually make recommendations under law because they have no enforcement power and they have no inspection authority. But they used their knowledge base and their research authority to create partnerships with people that are in the R&D side of nanotechnology in order to really start an effective database about how to handle what are otherwise dangerous things quite effectively. And wouldn't you know that WHO, the World Health Organization, followed in this trajectory and made guidelines for workplace exposure to nanomaterials without defining work, without defining nanomaterial, and without defining health, because that's already defined in the World Health Organization Constitution. But the big news was that the guidelines, of course, they're only guidelines, and that's an entire conversation for another day that I would love to have. Please ask me, what's the difference between a guideline and a law, Elise? Well, there's a lot of contextual answers there about what difference, but because it's WHO, and as a general matter, people respect their work, even though their work in COVID-19 is highly controversial. The fact is that they have set forth an approach. It tracks very nicely the NIOSH approach, but it's global. And it relies very heavily on something called the Global System for, Chem for Harmonization of Chemical Hazards, the GHS, which is a series of treaties also worthy of an entire other discussion. What's fascinating is WHO has no inspection authority, no enforcement authority. And the most fascinating thing here, remember I told you that the Swiss government was among many other governments that were worried without knowing exactly what to do. No one has exactly connected a specific exposure from nanomaterials in the workplace to a specific set of negative health outcomes. And yet we have these guidelines. Why? Because sound occupational health programs that implement best strategies are the grease for the machinery of powerful economic engines. They are not the things that you cut back in, in lean economic times. And in fact, there is a whole developing literature that did not exist two or three years ago about how regulation actually supports not just research, but the ability of marginal companies to thrive by following the rules and following compliance, following things like the hierarchy of controls, the basic bricks for due diligence. And wouldn't you know, we always thought 
well, it's only in poor countries or it's only people without computers or it's only the people who are in small enterprises. And suddenly today, we know that we have a global interaction between all of the countries of the world using nanomaterials. We could expect to see like this photograph of the United Nations in my hometown, New York in the General Assembly. We could expect to see some kind of global agreement about nanotechnology, how it's used safely and what best practices look like. Maybe it'll be the UN and maybe it'll be a whole new organization we don't even know about. But what we do know is all of these things got thrown in the air by COVID-19. And the best thing you can do in an emergency is fall back on the few things you know you can depend on. So the paradox is that we have a global crisis that is definitely going to need a global answer under law. Something that will weigh the very difficult choices that I showed you at the very beginning of this talk against the new and emerging problems that we don't really have enough data about to make good decisions, but we have very hard choices. And in emergencies, government has the power to disregard any rules in order to protect the public and, of course, to keep collecting taxes. So what are some of the things that have happened? Well, first of all, the pandemic required an instant response. WHO on March 11th declared in this very same year that we're in, that the pandemic was a global crisis. It had been watching it before, but it declared an emergency. Within 48 hours, the presidents of both the French Republic and the United States of America got in there with executive orders. Those orders are very different in their methods, very different in their scope, but they share the value that this was something where the government had to get in there and have a response. They did it without asking the legislature. They did it without polling the general public or commanding a new election for COVID-19 response. With the stroke of the legislative pen that you see in President Macron's hand here, school stopped. Contracts for employment were erased because people were going to work at home if they were what the government thought was non-essential. If they were essential, they're on the front line. The government made this decision without regard to collective bargaining and what the contract said and who was doing these various activities in every country of the world. It isn't any one particular country that you could point to. And big data and nanotechnology helped really create this attempt at resolution because we were able to track the disease and see it so much more than we had ever seen before. It wasn't just somebody sending a note or calling somebody in another country and saying, hey, have you got disease there? Hey, yeah, we got disease. We have excellent data about where the disease is and how many people and how many cases and what type of, of symptoms and what type of response. And you saw lockdown in a cascade, a rainfall of executive orders. Airlines were grounded. They are now a marginal employer. Nobody in the stock market would have bet that 18 months ago. Restaurants are closed and people worry about the future of the restaurant, hotel and tourism industry. Farmers have no market. To, the chain of distribution is disrupted. And it doesn't really matter if it's a fancy little thing like oysters or if it's potatoes. The fresh markets in France are closed by executive order unless for some reason the local government insists to open them. Theaters and cinema, it's changed the face, not just of the world, but of the economy and how we're going to deliver health in the future. And at the same time, nanotechnology is part of this. So just to show you, even in the tiny little town where I have my house in the United States, the governor was wearing a mask and the town of 11,000 people had its own proclamation for how to respond to COVID-19. Now, what does that mean for the law? Well, for the law, it means that we are in a very complicated moment. We're in a time where people are establishing 
COVID-19 law laboratories in order to try and catalog all these laws and figure out ways to pull up information. What does it mean if you're a small company? So we had, as an example, a small pharmaceutical company in beautiful Switzerland that uses a lot of nanotechnology. And I just want to give you a quick look at how that changes their, their life because it's a very, very difficult problem. It's really difficult. First of all, it sounds great. Suddenly the pharma is in demand everywhere. They make internal hospital equipment for um, oxygen and ventilators and they have a closed system for some of the things that have to be sterile all the time. It sounds great, but suddenly there's new scrutiny because suddenly everybody is worried about whether there's a breach in the system. And this tiny company that's only worth 90 million um, Swiss francs, which for Swiss pharma is small and was for a long time was one single owner. This company suddenly it's inundated with requests that sounds great for marketing, but in fact, at the very, very same time must respond to this international scrutiny for what's going on in how it maintains its internal operations, how it ships and supplies, how it's available if there are questions about its material. So people who are working in one country, which is very typical in Swiss and living in another, usually have the right to move freely back and forth. But in fact, because of the restrictions that came in place, we have a whole new question of law that has reshaped their labor contract without any negotiation. And how do they get back and forth to take care of their children who may be on remote learning at home? Internally, this has meant temperature taken each day. Nanosensors, great. But every day they take temperature in order to be allowed on the pre premises. Employees are tested. No outside food because they're afraid of food com contamination, bringing COVID onto the, the premises. Some workers have longer hours and some have fewer hours. Some are remote and some are on site. This is very confusing and complicated. And for people that are home, we don't yet know what exactly the impact on stress and their own health and their financial hardship when they absorb their own overhead for their workplace. And we don't know what this means for any of the things that their job is actually supposed to achieve. But there is some good news. I'm showing you here Lady Gaga, who is my poster child for nanotechnology because first of all, were it not for nanotechnology, she couldn't possibly have the beautiful costumes she has, the amazing makeup, the amazing hair colors that sometimes are turquoise and sometimes pink, but also her ability to reach the world. Her ability in the, con in the concert, One World Together, to reach over 60 million people at the same time through a network a very rapid communication across TV stations and, and YouTube and private endeavors. I mean, the idea that one day we would live to see Paul McCartney singing in his kitchen and the Rolling Stones at the very same concert and, and Elton John in his backyard, along with gorgeous Johnny Legend singing and telling us about his family. This is a product of nanotechnology. And this product of nanotechnology did two things. Of course, it raised money and it brought some relief and some publicity to the problems, but it did bring people together in ways that were not possible before. If this had happened 10 or 15 years ago, this would not be possible. And it brings to mind some of the promising nano enabled applications. Now, even the communication that she used globally requires a whole host of international treaties and, and contracts. But putting that aside, we know that nanotechnology is going to be used in 3D printing for 
highly efficient PPE, for other tools against COVID, for point of care diagnostics. We know that the communications that Lady Gaga used on the phone are just as available for telehealth to help people in isolation, to help people who need medical care and have symptoms coming on. One of the things that I've been honored to work on is a project at the University of Grenoble for uh, silver nanowire circuitry on paper. I just look at the legal impact. But the fact is that that paper, the size of a business card, can have a circuit that can transmit information to the healthcare system, to healthcare providers, to other patients in support groups, to family members who are worried about that person. And of course, we know we have a whole host of bio nano interaction that we've been studying for a very long time. The technical stuff is on the slides so you can come back because the lab research to market is taking a whole new direction. And, and this is nanotechnology at its best. This, is, this particular list comes from the nanotechnology group that was mentioned when we were talking about Salonica. They have a nano-enabled nanotechnology observatory for COVID-19. They have been proactively cataloging and interacting with projects geared to looking at COVID-19 in detail, whether it's DNA and vaccine development or other things. So that brings us to a very important question. We have this horrible tragedy. We have millions of people who've been hurt. We have over a million have died. And we have the world on lockdown. For a while it was back and that didn't seem like a good idea. And it looks like we're heading to lockdown again. We in, 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 in France, everything's in lockdown. It's a time to pause and reflect and to ask some overdue questions. And nanotechnology can definitely help us with these questions. And of course the law capturing the randomness of life and trying to prevent a structure over chaos is very crucial here too. But these are the big, big questions that I want everyone to think about, not just today while I'm talking, but for a very long time. First of all, what is work? That's very important because we have occupational health strategies on COVID-19 and the question whether, whether COVID-19 is an occupational disease. Is it an occupational transmission that somehow something has to do with these guidelines I showed you before from NIOSH and WHO? What is work? And what's the parental role in teaching children at home? All of these countries have just taken the pen and said the kids are going to stay home and you're going to teach them now. Does that mean that we have somehow changed our value about education? What is there in that education that doesn't or does matter? And the emerging role of telehealth, that nanotechnology makes it possible to save people from an enormous amount of pain and suffering. And what difference do some of the distinctions under law like work and consumer, what does that make a difference if everyone is both a consumer and a worker and exposed to the risks and the fallout of COVID-19? Even people who considered themselves healthy before, no one has been untouched by COVID-19 because maybe they lost a loved one, or maybe they are the caretaker for somebody, or maybe their job was totally destroyed in, in the collapsing economy, or maybe their work has just been reshifted around and reconfigured. No one is untouched. And over a billion people lived under emergency government orders. So this is really transformative in society. Here are a list of the kinds of things that we need to think about in the time that we have this pause where people are home and because of COVID-19 not interacting with each other the way they ordinarily do. Because in conclusion, we're following a path charted for nanotechnology. This quote, which I hope you will return to from the National Nanotechnology Initiative under President Clinton in the 20th century 
talked about looking at, at new physical properties of matter in a way that could be used to combat all kinds of diseases and generate vaccines for what they said would be things that we haven't even imagined at the time. And this quote is right there in their report. So we're on the trajectory. And I would like to propose that on this trajectory, what we need to do is to really use this pause for reflection, not simply to say, I'm complaining about this and that was great and nano helped us with this and COVID could have been controlled, but to actually try to codify, to actually try to write down the lessons learned and the end user experiences, the lessons of patient care, the lessons about how we teach differently, how we have a conference in Turkey by Zoom instead of having it in Turkey, how all of these things have radically changed our life without our knowledge or consent, without our governments really asking us, but just trying to do the very best job they can to stem the tide of a huge tragedy. And legislative drafting is what I propose. I propose that people have an opportunity in some forum, just like these guys that Daumier drew, drew pictures of 200 years ago, to write down what they think is important about food insecurity and disrupted supply chains, about quarantine, about the health impacts of isolation, about the way nanotechnology can help break those problems, to write it down in a pandemic preparedness act because people feel very disempowered in a time of force majeure. The disconnect between the people and their government may have been really wearing thin, but it really becomes a gap in credibility in a time like COVID-19. We need the nanotechnology to give us the solutions and the communication, but having your say lets people express their opinions knowing that someone has listened and that their ideas are heard. And these guys could be any of us or all of us, whether it's in the European Parliament or in the United Nations itself in my hometown. I suggest that as a proposal that we think about how to codify the lessons learned and write them down so we have a new approach to heightened preparedness for the next pandemic, there will be one, of course, because we've now learned a very, very fundamental lesson. We have learned that work, health, and the survival of civil society are inextricably linked. It's not just about the health of one person anymore, and it's not just about a particular target vulnerable group that's either too young or too old or too much this race or too much that race. Health is a social good without which our society comes to a halt during pandemic. And even the strongest, biggest multinational employers become marginal employers. We can't afford that. We need to write down what we've learned in this time of pause. And nanotechnology helps us to do that because whether you're a, a nanomaterial maker or a nanomaterial consumer, the tragic pause of COVID-19 is a chance to reshape our view of our health and commerce and use innovation to advance health so that nanotechnology's revolution for commerce will also revolutionize public health. And I wanna thank you for your attention because this has been an enormous opportunity for me. And I hope that, um, that you uh, enjoyed this talk, that you have questions.